Hello and welcome to how to create a coordinated sales and marketing program. This is a webinar done with Scrappy ABM and Influ2. And let me tell you, I'm incredibly, incredibly excited to be doing this today with the wonderful Anna, who's the head of ABM at Influ2. She's going to share a lot of actually practical things. I'm going to blabber on around frameworks and processes and all that kind of stuff. She's going to give you some really practical and tactical examples. So if you're joining us live today, thank you so much for being here. Go ahead and drop in the comments what you're hoping to get out of today uh, with that. Anna, thank you so much for being here. Oh my God, thank you so much for having me. I didn't know you're such a good speaker. I'm like stumbled. <laughs> no, I, uh, for whatever you're reason, people, professionally, uh, they just keep showing up for podcasts. So I just turn on my podcast voice and it's a good time. So yeah, all that to say, we've got a ton of very actionable tactical content to get through today. And I wanna make sure we dive right into it. So again, thank you so much for being here. There's always this question when you join a session of like, how do I get the most out of it? And I wanna tell you right now. So what you're gonna to wanna to do is if you are like me and maybe you've got like a notebook on your desk and you've got like a maybe a pen, you're gonna go ahead and write down in your notebook a quick framework that is data, distribution, destination, and direction. We'll come back to that here in just a moment. The next thing you're gonna do is you're here today, which is awesome. What likely happened is your team isn't here. They're off doing other things. So what I want you to do is go ahead and look into your Slack and message the team and say, hey, I'm on this thing with a bunch of people around ABM that they may have some answers for us if you guys are trying to build it. So go ahead and send a message to your team curating some questions and just saying, hey, we're gonna talk through how to build coordinated marketing programs. And then lastly, you want to go ahead and set a time block on your calendar for next week with your content team. Primary goal here with your content team is you want to ensure that you've got great content that actually speaks directly to the audience you're trying to go after. So with that, let's go ahead and dig into some quick questions. Quick, just type it in the comments. Who is familiar with the crawl, walk, run approach to ABM? Go ahead and type that real quick in the comments. While people are typing that in, we are going to go ahead and keep running through it because most everybody is familiar with the crawl, walk, run approach to ABM. And generally speaking, when we think about ABM, there is this recognition of, well, we have to crawl. Like we all know that we have to crawl, but nobody likes to crawl because crawling sucks. And when you think about the idea of crawling, um, this is actually my daughter. So you may hear her in the background. But fun fact, it takes a child from age zero to age seven months, sometimes 10 months to even learn to crawl. From there, it then takes them a ballpark of like uh, about 18, or sorry, it's uh, 10 to 18 months to learn to walk. And lastly, they learn to run about 18 to 24 months of age. So again, from zero to run takes a baby about 18 months. But again, crawling sucks. So we don't want to crawl. We want to run. So how do we run? Well, obviously, we take a baby that doesn't even know how to get to crawl. And we just give them the best equipment. Because it's obviously the equipment. Like, it's all the right tools and equipment that makes us capable of being incredibly effective runners. So obviously, by taking something that doesn't even know how to crawl, that doesn't even know how to get started, and giving them the best equipment, that's going to result in Usain Bolt. We are going to run incredibly well. This program is going to take off to the moon. It's going to scale forever and ever and ever and ever. Of course not. No, we just set a bunch of money on fire because we we bought something and said, oh, this will fix all of our problems. But we didn't think how we're going to use it. So that's the reality for a lot of people when it comes to building an ABM program. Great ideas, great tools, but tools without foundations or just the fundamentals aren't very helpful. So all that said, hi, my name is Mason Cosman, the founder of a company called Scrappy ABM. Uh, but before I did all that, I was a husband and I'm a father and I always like to just call out uh, that I can't do what I get to do if I don't have the supportive spouse that I have that helps take care of our little baby girl. So love our family. Uh, but as I mentioned, founder of Scrappy ABM, in the past three years, I've sourced about $8 million in revenue through marketing programming that has been with next to no tech stack. It's been next to no resources. It's been a lot of like scrappy approaches that were just really, really hard. And what that resulted in is about a 20X ROI. 
So we founded this company about a year ago with the intent of being the only ABM service provider that delivers step-by-step -step programs for the crawl stage of account-based marketing. And our goal for today is to help you build those crawl stage programs. That said, I'm joined by someone much more intelligent than I am named Anna. So Anna, please introduce <laughs> yourself. Thank you so much. It's such an amazing introduction. And I actually hate introductions, so following such a great one is a real challenge here. But as you can see, I've come prepared and I'm trying to get some cute points <laughs> with my cat here because I don't have that's I think that's the closest what I have to a child right now. And in terms of my professional experience, can we switch to the next slide here? Um, I've been the head of ABM at Influ2 uh, for over a year now. And in my first year, together with the team, we've had we have fueled 123% growth in ABM influenced revenue. And that all done through using our own product. And at my previous job, uh, together with the team, we've contributed to a 52 and a half million Series B fundraising round. And that's all thanks to an amazing result of a 4X ARR growth. And back to you, Mason. So like I said, much more intelligent than I am. I'm incredibly excited to dig in some of the practical examples. Before we get into that, I always like to level set because when you Google ABM, or if you asked 100 marketers what ABM is, you're probably going to get a different 100 different definitions. So we always like to make sure we're all talking about the same thing. And ABM, for the purposes of our conversation today, is a B2B revenue strategy that aligns the revenue team around a set of shared target accounts. So when I use the word revenue team, that's marketing, that's sales, and that's CS. So it's a whole, it's a whole big thing. It's a very cross-functional uh, program that you can run. The other thing that makes me super fun at parties is why ABM fails. I keep talking about this stuff all the time, uh, but if we don't think about why it fails, then we're gonna make the same mistakes that are already well documented. So there are three core reasons why every ABM program generally fails. And the first is that there's a lack of sales and marketing alignment. The quick example I like to always give is marketing will say, we've delivered a ton of leads. And then sales will say, we have no leads. And sales means when they say leads, like in pipeline opportunities that they're actively working. When marketing says leads, they mean contacts generated. So we use the same words, but they mean different things. And as a result, we're speaking a different language. And then we add in the complexity of the account-based marketing language of like target account engagement and third-party intent data and second-party data. Like it, you add a new vocabulary. So if you couldn't speak the language in the first place, you've now added new words that all have different meanings to different people. So as a result, we're just not aligned on what we're actually trying to accomplish. That's been very well talked about but still is a massive problem and is the number one reason that ABM fails. Next is lack of dedicated resources. So what will often happen in the worst thing that can happen today, and I mean this sincerely, there's a CMO or a VP of marketing that is on this call or a CEO that listens to this and is like, I love ABM. I wanna build an ABM program. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna take this idea of ABM and they're gonna to go to their marketing manager and they're gonna throw it at them and say, you get to build an ABM program now. Can you go do ABM? That marketing manager, though, already had a full-time day job doing a lot of other things. So now you just casually threw cross-functional and organizational change at a marketing manager. They have then given the accountability to build ABM, but not the authority to facilitate organizational change. So they don't have the resources. They don't have the ability to do what you've asked them to do. And as a result, it kind of just gets pushed to the side. And then inevitably, somebody's like, so how's our ABM program going? And then they get really frustrated because it's been six months and there's been zero progress. So if nobody owns it, it doesn't get figured out. You need dedicated resources, especially at the executive level to facilitate this organizational change. And then lastly, it's really hard to measure, like super hard to measure, because I would just give you a quick example of how people build out an account scoring model. They take third-party intent data to get in-market buying signals. They then take into account firmographic information to make sure you're going after the right kind of people. Then they take into account first-party engagement data. And on top of that, they marry that with the individuals within the buying committee that are actually engaging. Those are four different points that you then cobble together to say, these are our top tier accounts that are highly engaged and likely to buy. That's really hard to measure if you don't have the right tooling in place. So often we'll go buy the tools we don't know how to use to, to measure. And we end up spending more time figuring out the measurement piece versus actually running a program. So like, it's just kind of this catch 22 moment where do you build the reporting or do you build the program? Because you build the program, you don't know how to measure it. You don't know if it's working. If you build the reporting and you don't build the program, you've got beautiful dashboards that have zero data. So what do you do? Well, I'm glad you asked because that's what we're gonna talk about for the rest of this time. And what you do is what we refer to as an activation play. So the definition of an activation play 
would just be activation plays are the repeatable processes for when sales or CS become involved in specific customer conversations. That sounds really basic, and it is by design. Prime example, you have customer accounts that are showing significant levels of utilization. They're coming right up against their ability to use the platform. That's an expansion playbook. You activate your CS team to expand that account because they are massively using your platform and they need to move up in tier. Great opportunity. Next one, target account hits our product page, our pricing page, and our schedule a call page, but doesn't yet book a call. Probably want to pass that to sales because sales will be like, that's awesome. Definitely want to talk to them. That's it. And like, we just don't do that. We're really focused on really complex programs that factor into all account, all these like different data sources. But like at the end of the day, we have people that are hitting our website that we don't talk to. We have people we meet at events that we never follow up with. We have closed loss programs that have been touched since they said thanks but no thanks, but they still haven't solved the problem they were trying to solve. So if you re-engage those accounts, huge pipeline opportunities. So with that, why does this work? Again, glad you asked. The first thing is that the alignment between marketing and sales comes way more naturally because again, it's not this super complex approach of like, oh, they hit this perfect score that like nobody really understands. We should reach out. It's like they did this action, if then statements. They did this, we do this. Makes it really simple. Speaking of which, keeps things really simple. That's why people can buy into it because they're like, oh, I get it. And it's hard to argue with the idea that, man, if we're going outbound and we focused on people that already know that we exist and have an understanding of our products, we should probably focus there. Crazy idea. And then lastly, this is kind of like the bat behind the scenes. You can start your transitions within your KPIs and your MarTech stack to effectively measure engagement because you're now focused less on individual form fills and scoring mechanisms around leads, but individual engagement touch points to understand they do these actions, they engage in these ways, we do these responses. So you're now starting to build a profile of engagement of what are your highest engagement opportunities that lead to better conversions. So it builds in the background. All that said, how does it work? Really simple. Identify a trigger, build an operationalized and outbound sequence, run it over and over and over again. You will always have more clothes lost. You will always have more website engagement. You will always have customers to expand. You will always have customers to win back. That data stays the same. The messaging may change over time as the product changes, as the market changes, but those data sources, those workflows, those just run. And the reason you operationalize an outbound sequence here versus running an ad program as a starting point all the time or running any other programming is it helps that alignment with your sales team because you force the alignment with sales. Now, to be clear, we have a lot of ad examples towards the end of this. Ad programming is a great way to get in front of your target accounts. But with the alignment with sales, you end up facilitating a longer term engagement and relationship that turns into a full scale ABM program. So how do we think through these programs? Man, I've talked for about 10 minutes, so we're about to get into some great examples. Activation play structure, it's four buckets. The first bucket is data. You're answering three questions here. Who are we going after? Why are we reaching out? And how do we message these people appropriately? Who is it? Why are we reaching out? How do we message them? Next is distribution. These are just the channels you're going to use to get in front of these people. Could be email, could be organic social, could be paid social, could be paid search, could be a webinar, could be any number of things but how do we get in front of these people? Next is destination. So what are we pushing them to? What is the content that they need to understand to take the next step towards becoming our customer? To be clear, this may be a blog. It could be a webinar, it could be a podcast. It doesn't have to be book a call page. Sometimes it should be, but probably not. Most of the time, the goal is further education that gets people to recognize the value that you offer. <laughs> Lastly is then direction. So how do we track any of this to ensure that we're actually engaging with the right fit kind of people? So that's the playbook structure. And here, if you want to take a quick screenshot, here are just a variety of options that work in your prospect buckets, your opportunity buckets, and your customer buckets. So at the end of the day, those are the three places you're looking. Prospects are to generate pipeline, opportunities are to accelerate pipeline, and customers are to expand and retain the customer base. So lots and lots of information on that front. The question then becomes, what playbook should you run? So. Great place to start, close lost opportunities. So you're gonna look at your current close lost opportunities from a filtering perspective of closed lost reason plus firmographics. And I put a plus one here, if you can also get website engagement, like they've recently been on your website, re-exploring you or intent data that showcases 
uh, third party in market buying signals. So you're looking at why did you lose them? Who are they? And then maybe a reason to re-engage around in uh, website engagement or intent data. If you don't have that, generally speaking, close lost is a time-based re-engagement program of like six months has passed or nine months have passed, or sometimes three months. It just kind of depends on the length of your contract standardly in your industry. But your reason to re-engage is generally tying back to something in our organization has changed or something in your organization has changed. And you want to talk about the change as a way of overcoming the past close lost reason. And if you cohort this by close lost reason plus firmographics, you can kind of templatize your messaging. It's not generalized brand messaging. It's like pretty specific, but you can cohort this around 30 to 40 accounts. And it's a one to few type program. Next would then be distribution. Great place to start would be an outbound email program. Additionally, you can use things like social ads. This is super underutilized, but just like showing up in people's comments or on their content if they post on social is a non-threatening positive touch point that you as a seller can provide to somebody to, rem to remind people that you exist. Like if you've sent them emails and then you start showing up with meaningful comments on their content, they're gonna remember that you sent them an email too. Next would also be DMs. And then lastly are search ads. So again, if they're already showing in-market signals, showing up continued where they are already searching for viable solutions is a great way to ensure that you keep showing up in front of them. Next is then destination. So you want to, again, have content that directly addresses why you lost last time. This could be, if you're a tech platform, product updates that outline in some level of detail, hey, here's what's changed. And ideally, you're making it contextual to those accounts of why that matters for them, not just a feature dump, but hey, this was a problem that our customer base was experiencing. We made these updates that make our, your life better. Here's how. Next would then also be relevant industry news that makes you more uniquely qualified to solve the problem. This is a quick example. Uh, I know it's tied up in some courts right now, but the FTC in the US overturned non-compete agreements. So if you're a staffing firm that you're trying to re-engage closed loss deals, you now have a very unique opportunity that's a point in time moment that has changed, not within that company specifically or your organization, but the way that the game is played of recruiting and staffing has changed because regulate, regulation has changed. As a result, you can then create content that directly addresses how that benefits them. So again, that is a unique moment in time type thing. Lastly is direction. So you're gonna look for content engagement, a book meeting or account engagement on the site. So that is a closed loss program. And then to close the loop, they, if they don't book the meeting, you just continue to follow up with more next step content based on the past content that they engaged with. So it's not just a set it and forget it type approach. It's an intentional following them along their journey to get them back into the customer or into being a customer. So with that, Anna, you've got a ton of very practical examples around specific segmentation for closed loss reasons. So yeah. I'm going to pass it back to you. I just, I also wanted to add something. So one of her best AEs, she's very good with social ads. And that means she they go back and forth with her prospects, with her connections in the comments. And she ended up getting three deals out of, out of her engagement post on LinkedIn. We were like, wow. <laughs> so yeah, That's those amazing. connections really work. And in terms of the closed loss reasons, so I've come up with five main closed loss reasons that you could use for audience segmentation and then also personalization. And again, just to mention that I'm going to be talking about the ads, but what you guys have to be looking at is the messaging. And also keep in mind that all of those plays we do in sync with our SDR and with our AEs together. So the email is an essential part of those campaigns. So um, let's talk about the five reasons for the closed loss opportunities. So the first one is the no product functionality. Let's say you don't have the essential functionality that the account needs to close with you. And again, it's a great opportunity to follow up on that once you have that functionality added to your product. Let's say there is a strategy on fit. There could be a blocker in the buying committee that has the decision making power, but is just very against buying you for some reason. One of the most popular is budget constraints. I think we've all had that during the, I think, I can't remember when we didn't have that. <laughs> I think that's always very popular reason. And then again, lost connection, um, especially the lost connection when they kind of ghost you and you don't know why they left. And I'm going to talk in detail about each one. Okay, Mason, let's move on. 
So the first one is the functionality uh, at play. Um, so what I'm sharing right now is something that we've done. So everything I'm sharing right now is actually something that we've done and used uh, at Influ2. So what happened with us is we used to have a version one of the product and we didn't have a lot of features. It was just basically person-based advertising, contact level intent. And we then had a version two released, which add a whole bunch of new functionality. And what you can see here is that we segmented our audience by the close loss reason and by AE ownership. So we have this very generic, I would say, value prep about revenue marketing, but we're also announcing that there is a V2 of the product and we're showing the face of the AE that they already know that's saying, hey, let's reconnect. And as supporting trust content that we're showing at the same audience, we have um, we have a p content piece where our current customers that are already using the version two of the product are sharing their experience. So once, once you have new functionality, that's something that you can do. Um, now the person blocker. Um, so we use audience scope, but there is a bunch of tools that you could be utilizing for that to track when the enemy kind of leaves the company and moves on to a different one and use that as a time as a signal, as a trigger to time your campaigns and outreach. And again, we're using the AE ownership and the messaging is just like offering, are you ready to reevaluate us? We're not disclosing that we know that the guy's out or the girl's out, but we are kind of trying, trying to hit them in their DMs. Um, and one of the good things, if you are going into a one-to-one -one direction, you could try and show them the initial value proposition that sparked their interest. Or if you're going after, in, if you're using a one-to-few approach, maybe just select one of your most like best performing trust content or best performing value proposition. Should I be telling you next slide or is it, I'm like making this pause? Okay, those are strategy change. So basically the strategy, if if the strategy changes when the person who's responsible for the strategy changes. So basically it's a leadership position change that you can again track either through um, LinkedIn or you can track it using a tool. And the messaging that we are selecting here is showing a strategic value proposition. Let's say here we're going, we're, we're comparing accounts versus decision makers. And then also you can see that the trust content is very also, is also very high level. And by the way, um, it's, it's a nice thing here that you start targeting them with ads immediately when they start their position, but then start the outreach, kind of nurture them with the ads and the content here, and then start the outreach, I mean, like three to four months after they've been, they've been in. Uh, the budget at play is one of my favorite because we had a bunch of opportunities out of it. And um, timing is crucial here. So there are a few approaches that you could take. Um, one is um, looking for funding, for funding signals, and um, then your messaging would be wouldn't be say, "Hey, we know you got some money. <laughs> uh, let's let's talk again," but asking if it's a priority at the time. But the example that you see right here is something that we did at the end of 2023. Uh, where we went after all of the closed lost, um, no budget um, accounts, hoping that they did have some extra budget that they were really needed to burn before the next fiscal year. So make sure you track when the fiscal year ends for your prospects, because sometimes it's not the end of the year in some industries. And we were very polite with asking, um, are they planning their 2024 initiatives? And again, it's a either they already know asking them to reconnect. And the supporting trust is really about building the future MarTech solution, which is something we consider ourselves to be. And we've got a great question from yep. Matt. Uh, his just question is, love this signal. Where are we getting the funding signal data? Well, if it's a close, it depends on how many accounts you have. Sometimes they will do that manually. I think you can also go and look at that at Crunchbase and have like um, like once for three months, you can go and look at the accounts that you're interested in to see if they've had any funding added. 
Awesome. The other thing that I've seen. They also do PR releases when there is a huge funding. So yeah, like Google alerts are, are a good way. And then also there's a, a tool that's like 20 bucks a month called FYI GTM. That's a research tool. So you could actually just type in uh, funding rounds in specific verticals, and then it will just serve up all the funding rounds that have happened in the next or in the past two weeks. So variety of ways you can get those signals. Um, and then Kyle is also just maybe saying from the insights of the sales team. So maybe the sales team is getting some some uh, pointers on, hey, things people are getting some funding rounds because often sales is looking at some of those things more closely. Yep. So with that. Uh, the lost connection when they ghost you. So sometimes they don't mean to ghost you. And when they don't mean to ghost you, this is the message that we're trying to use is asking whether we are getting lost in their inbox. Basically, there is the SDR owner of the account. And we are just, you know, assuming that the person's priorities changes, they got overworked. Um, you know, they work in marketing, their priorities change all the time, things get thrown at them. So just reminding them about yourself and using ads is another channel. And again, the SDR is also emailing them sequences uh, right at this moment um, is something that we like to do. And then if they are not responding to that, we try to kind of spark uh, the interest with them by showing some use cases that we think are going to be relevant or some most um you know, most popular use cases that you have that you with the best results. Love it. So again, that was just five super practical closed lost reasons segments plus messaging and a couple of practical ways that you can start to actually implement this. And again, yes, ad programming is absolutely fantastic and is a great way to engage your audiences. But if you don't have an ad budget right now, this can be done through email using the same messaging. It's just that ad program will add a new channel that engages the same audience in a different way that they may be less likely to ignore. Uh, I think we all have some uh, mental spam blocker fatigue in some of our emails sometimes. So all that to say, love those examples. As we get into kind of a mismeaning playbook, depending on how you're using your CRM, hopefully you've got your CRM integrated into your seller's calendars and they have meetings that are showing up on the contact and the deal records and even just kind of natively with an upspot you could actually do a what was the meeting result and it could be a no-show and whenever you have a meeting that is designated as no-show that becomes then the trigger for a re-engagement program on missed meetings so your distribution channels again can be email social ads social engagement and dms admittedly for a lot of these playbooks the distribution channels will likely be largely the same the core difference will then be what you send them to, what your triggers are, and how you message them appropriately. So as we look at destination, admittedly, this is gonna be largely focused on just rebooking. If they don't rebook for a while, then I'd go lean pretty heavy into use case and case study content that builds the pain. Because again, if they've booked a call, they likely already shared with you through their booking link or through some form of information. Those are problems we're trying to solve for. So if you can build that pain and help them understand that you are the viable solution to overcoming that pain, then it's a higher likelihood that they would actually re-engage. And then the direction, pretty simple. Did they rebook the meeting? If they did, you did it. If they didn't, you didn't. So as we look at then some practical examples around messaging, I'm gonna pass it back over to Anna. Yeah. So when when we're talking about emails, your messaging is going to depend on how much communication you had with them and what you actually know about their pain points. So I would suggest going after their specific points in the email. But through the ad from the ad standpoint, uh, this is what I do. And this is one of my favorite things to do. I have that set up for missed meetings. And I also have that set up as a show up rate, as like as a show up campaign. So why I like it so much is because it's completely automated. So once from the marketing standpoint, once I've created the ads and landing pages, it then works for me. I would like to say that it works for me while I relax, but I just do other tasks actually. So um, the two data points um, that you're gonna use here is again, account ownership and the information that the call didn't take place and they didn't show up. Um, in this example, you can see that, that distribution. Let's move to the next slide. 
And how we do it in the background in our CRM, we're using Salesforce. So once the opportunity status is changed to no show, the prospects are then automatically moved to an AE dedicated no show campaign in Salesforce that has already been synced with a product and that already has the content in there. So they are then started, uh, they're then seeing the ads that are programmed for them every time that there is a no show and they drop out automatically. Um, also, again, you can set up a whole bunch of triggers. You can use a whole bunch of triggers to take them out. It can be a time period, a call actually taking place. So that would be an opportunity change or a gong signal. And then I'm gonna tell you more about the messaging that we use. So I designed it into a two-step campaign. So the first one, we just assumed that, hey, maybe something got in the way, maybe they forgot. So we offer a very easy way to reschedule with us. It's a direct, um, uh, it's a campaign that gives them direct access to AE's calendar to reset the meeting with a specific AE that they've been talking to. And if that doesn't work, we're like, okay, so let's assume that maybe they their interest kind of faded and they don't want to commit to that 30, 40 minute meeting. So we try and lower the bar and have them commit to like a four minute video about our product um, that has a chance to ignite their interest again. And I just have to say, when you shared that with me before, when we were prepping for this, I was like, that is absolutely genius. Like there's clearly express interest because they booked the meeting in the first place. It may just be something mm -hmm. like i don't have 40 minutes but i have four and i can put on 2x speed and watch like that is just so genius and you can templatize those based on verticals and common problems it's like you don't even have to make it all like you can make them pretty high quality if you end up doing it that way so super super uh awesome approach a couple of questions already uh of just one would be around ad budgets i mean for some of these programs you guys are running uh specifically to individual accounts like do you have any benchmarks on how you guys are spending for individual accounts? Uh, it's not too much because we are um, running ads for decision makers. So even when I'm going after a huge account, because I have the luxury of using our own product, I'm going to be going after like eight to 10 people on the account. And we only pay for the content that's been served. So that's, that's not going to be a huge budget. Awesome. The next especially question for, is, especially for these sorry, especially for these campaigns where your audience is not is not huge. It's not. It's um it's very easy. Yeah. Which leads in actually to our next question, which would be how are you finding and breaking down your one to one and one to many targets? So I this is a slightly separate, but I think it's a great, great question of like for me personally, I do one-to-ones based on very, very specific criteria around engagement, just because again, I run a company called Scrappy ABM. So our one-to-ones are generally highly engaged people that would be like a missed meeting program or a closed lost opportunity or things like that. Honestly, for most of our other programming, we focus on vertical specific programs or problem specific programs that are largely one-to-many or one-to-few. So that's how I like to think through the breakdown, but Anna, I know that you've got a different perspective. Well, I think that when you have really high intense signals, going with a one to few can be more effective. You just, because if they have high, if they really have high intent and you have captured it the right way, you know they have it, they're going to convert even from a one to few. You don't have to wow them with a one to one campaign. So for a one to one campaign, I, I'm leaning towards, and I change my mind from time to time. So, but right now I'm leaning towards running one to one campaigns for like very specific, mostly desirable logos that we want to convert and that we know are going to benefit from us because we know that they have the right setup in their marketing and sales departments to utilize Influ2, but maybe they're not showing that demand. So building that demand for a one-to-one -one campaign would be something I'll be um, interested in. But for accounts like this, where we know that there is a high intent, I would go with a one-to-few and they're going to convert just as well. Yeah. Great other follow-up question from Kyle would just be, how do we then separate our one-to-many or one-to-few or one-to-one -one programs for uh, from other larger general demand gen programs? It's a very like open question. If you if you guys I, I can, can just yeah, what do you, what do you think, Mason? Yeah, I mean it's just segmentation. From from my perspective, you've got your always-on programs, 
And for so many people, a good starting ABM program is just account-based promotion towards your larger demand gen programs. So if you have good segmentation in place, which is what you should for a solid ABM program, you're just creating exclusions or inclusion lists based on the different audiences you're, you're trying to serve. So that's, that's the most simple answer. Uh, but to your point, that is a very open-ended question that is got a lot of nuances based on the individual tech stack and the overall strategy. But for a simple answer, less segmentation. Yeah. Uh, I also am realizing what time we are at and we've got about 10 minutes and a couple more examples. So we see the questions in the chat. First of all, we love the fact that there are questions. Second of all, we'll come back to those at the very end. So that said, let's quickly run through event activation. Uh, for event activation, this is pre-event. So we're focused on how do we book meetings when we are at events. Um, Matt's in the chat and knows that I love a good event, event activation playbook because he actually saw me book and close a meeting uh, at BWMX. So just for context, the way that I like to think through the data sets would be one of three places. First would be the event website or event app. Uh, there are speakers that are listed on the website. Speakers can be target accounts. So you already know the speakers are going to be there. There may also be sponsors that you would want to also work with. So the website actually gives you some pretty good indications of what companies will be there. And then if there ends up being an event app of some kind, you can log into the event app and actually see the entire uh, like event registration list before the event. And you just use the event app as a way of identifying and then starting to book meetings beforehand. Next would be social. Lots of events have specific hashtags. So you can just search by hashtag to see who's posting. Like people are already posting about inbound. And inbound is still like two months away. And they've been posting about inbound for like four months already. So if there are significant events, then you can actually see pretty early, like who's going. And then lastly, it would just be if you've been an event sponsor, I tend to go to the same events most years because I've already validated that those are good events for me. So like, I'm probably just gonna go again next year. So if you already know who went last year, you can just target them. You're not gonna have a 100% hit rate, but it's a much higher likelihood than going cold to your entire <laughs> LinkedIn network and just saying, hey, who's going to this event? So that's why I like to think about data. Next will be distribution. So this is gonna be email, LinkedIn, ideally, I used to think it was so stupid to use the event app because I was like, all this data is going to get lost. But what I realized is that nobody uses the event app for any messages. And when you send a message in an event app, it then likely also emails the person that they got a message. So it's actually two distribution channels for the cost of one where it's significantly uncrowded. So you may log in. They may not do it like right away, but again, it's there. And almost nobody uses the event apps to send messages. And then lastly, you have social ads as a way of getting in front of these people to maybe route them towards uh, your booth or a session. Next is in destination. So again, I'm recommending two. If you're hosting a session, push people to the session. If you have a booth, push them to the booth, or you can just push them to a meeting. So again, those are really the two core places slash three core places you would want to send people to. And then lastly, from a direction component, if you push them towards a session, did they register? If you push them towards a meeting, did they book a meeting? That's how you track this. So again, it's not intended to be overly complicated. As we think through then some of the awesome <laughs> event things that they've done, speaking of B2B MX, uh, you guys killed it. So Anna, walk us through that. Yeah, I feel like this is going to be a little bit complicated. I have so many, I have so many slides. By the way, about the event app, um, something that works really well for outreach is actually reaching out to the person on the event app. And if they don't see it, you can follow up on LinkedIn and be like, hey, I actually messaged you on the event app and they feel guilty and they respond. <laughs> that works. <laughs> oh my gosh. Because they're like, oh, I missed it. I'm now interested. What's there? I missed, I missed. It's like the feeling of the missed mail. Um, so again, thank you for covering the audience select selection part for me. And I'm just going to cover really quickly uh, the messages that we like to do. So uh, once we have the list, we're going to segment it into a bunch of different segments, but I'll cover that later. So the first thing you want to do is you want to introduce your team and you want to make sure that their faces are on the ads because they are going to be in one room. They're going to be talking to each other, bumping into each other at the event. And uh, they will have this like additional layer of recognition, like face, facial recognition, um, and people are more likely to talk to them. Of course, if you have a speaking session, uh, it's best that you promote it to get as many as many listeners as possible. Next slide. Yep. 
Uh, again, there is a whole competition of incentive uh, at events right now when everyone's trying to come up with new and new ideas. So it's very easy to get lost uh, in the competition. So we try to promote what incentives we've prepared for them and try and make it as as interesting as possible. And an interesting part here is that um, on the right, you can see Annette with Chris, our VP of Partnerships. And I've actually segmented the audience out by their titles and selected the people who are um, who have partnerships in their titles for, that Chris actually wanted to talk to. And I targeted them specifically with his face because I don't want him to talk to our CMO. I don't want him to talk. I would want them to talk to like our AEs. We want to talk to partnerships. And if you are doing any site events, um, in this example, we did two. And again, they were separated based on who was hosting which event. So we pushed marketers and customers to a dinner. And we then pushed sales and ops to a golf because, because that's uh, that depended on who was hosting. And um, it becomes even more interesting after the event because you actually know the level of engagement that you had at the event with certain people. And we like to divide them into two buckets. Um, <clears throat> we ask to continue the conversation, you know, let's keep the good vibes going with those that we've connected at the event and that data you have either from your diligence salespeople who have an Excel sheet and uh, track everyone they've spoken to, or you have a, you know, a scanner and you just scan everyone who comes to your booth. And then for those that you didn't get a chance to talk to at the event, we say, hey, we didn't get a chance to talk to at the event, but we want to talk. So let's connect. And here is this level of personalization that, you know, we really want to talk to you at the event that we all been to. And if your list is just too small and you, you don't have the capacity to divide them into uh, two buckets, here's an example of what we've done for a B2B rocks, which is a slightly smaller event than a B2B mix, where we just say, hey, let's chat, let's chat after the, this event. And of course, we share the recorded session with people who were there. And we also share it with our you know, entire list because that's great content. Yeah, and this part is going to be a little bit more product focused, but we've been talking about, you know, building sales and marketing alignment uh, together. And as you can see, all of the ad campaigns that I've shown, they all depend on the sales context that you have. And that means you're going specifically after the audience that your sales are interested in. You're not wasting any of the marketing efforts on the audience that your sales are not going to follow up on because you are literally going after the perfect the perfect people for them. And um, what you can actually do is not just use the sales context to uh, show ads. You can actually use the ad context and engagement with person-based advertising um, to pass it on to sales. And I'm just going to have like a couple of slides explaining how it works. Yeah, so an example of data provided by contact level intent that you see here, you know that as a marketer and your sales team and your sales people are, will know who is actually engaged by name. They will know what the person engaged with and when they engage with it. And you as a marketer will have an overview of the email outreach and say was being diligent and following up on all of the engagement that you think are relevant. So basically with that, you know who's clicking, who's seeing and who's clicking on your ads and when. And using those signals in bulk will help your sales prioritize outreach because they know maybe you will integrate it into your scoring system. Maybe you will, um, you know, build your journey so that at certain point, a target becomes prioritized for sales outreach. So that all depends on how you do it. But basically, you can build a prioritization model um, using contact level intent. And on the next slide, I'm going to tell you how I'm going to show you how um, this engagement data can actually be used by the sales. So instead of um, instead of going when, they, when they're reaching out to the prospect, instead of going to the LinkedIn and saying, hey, I really liked your post on LinkedIn. It was amazing. They can actually go and see the ad and the value proposition or any kind of content that you're promoting that the person has engaged with and then incorporate that in their 
email because you can have a strong assumption that this is something they're interested in. This is the topic that would would catch their attention again. And I think that's it. Awesome. So we've got a couple of questions that are already in the chat. And I know we're already right at time, but if you will have other questions, go ahead and drop them in. Uh, Matt, you asked, what are you using for person targeting where you only have eight people to target per account platform wise? There are so many minimum audience size to even run ads. Well, Anna, I think you have some great expertise on ad platforms. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, I only use Influ2 to run ads, and Influ2 takes care of all of those limitations. So, um, but I wouldn't suggest doing like, it's a lot of work to do like one to one um, after eight people. But what I would usually do is I will have the audience to have a one to few audience size. But again, that would not be a limitation for Influ2, but it's not advised. I would say you go. Um, like you collect a number of closed lost opportunities to have enough audience. You will go after specific people, but since you're going after a number of accounts, you will have enough audience to do that. Perfect. And then last question that we've got right now would just be curious if you've tested video ads for any of these, for these event or post event ad plays. Yes, I have tested and I'm going to be doing a video ad for this event we're recording right now. And they work a lot better, especially if you get a good editor that uh, will have like will have a like like an engaging video ad. And something I suggest doing for your video ads is highlighting the subtitles because you never know whether those sub whether you will be the ad will be muted or the ad will be will have the um We'll have the sound. So yeah. So I think the what's important, either having a really nice edited video ad or make sure that your title is spot on because sometimes title is like the only thing that matters. You can have a crappy ad, but if like the topic and the content is great and relevant, people are going to click on it. It sounds perfect. Well, Anna, no more questions. Thank you so much for joining me today. Again, you'll get the recording if you've registered for this. If you have any other questions, obviously you've got Anna's LinkedIn right there. You can also follow me on LinkedIn. And if you want more content like this, go check out Influ2 or go check out the Scrappy ABM podcast where this will also be uh, released as well. So again, thank you so much for joining us today and we'll look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thank you.